Welcome to Together. If you haven't been here before, we're delighted to have you. This is our monthly women's gathering here at Mission City Church, and we love being together. Who's lo who loves Together? Awesome. Uh, well, my name is Marion, and this year we're talking about portraits. We're looking at women in the Bible, and we're looking at snapshots of specific women in Scripture. So we have two goals, that through this study, we're going to get a big picture of the Bible. If you want to know from Genesis to Revelation what the Bible's about, keep coming back every month, because that's our goal. And I also, I pray, as we look at these snapshots of these specific women, that we learn about a lot about who our God is. Because because here's the thing, God tells his story through real people who are struggling with real stuff, through marriages that are breaking down, through physical illness. God tells his redemption story through women who are walking through a broken world and we get to learn about ourselves and we get to learn about our God. Well, um, a little thing about me is I love all things British. Anybody besides me? I love anything that BBC, I love all British television. I, I'm a sucker for it. I love teas and scones, anybody else? I will go for high tea with anyone, anytime, let me know about it. Um, I love, um, I spent a summer in England, so I got a little bit immersed in the culture. Um, I love British movies, you know, the accent gets me every time. Um, I want to start tonight with a clip from a movie called Notting Hill. Who's seen it? I, I like this movie because I watched this film back when I was still single. And if you don't know my story, I was single for a really, 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 really add some decades on a really long time. And, um, and this movie is so great because in the film you see Julia Roberts. And when you watch her character, you like, she has everything, right? She's got everything. She's this famous Hollywood actress. She, her character plays this famous Hollywood actress. She's gorgeous, she has everything. And then she says this line, and I'm gonna let her say it for you, but um, she's ha she likes this guy, and they've kind of liked each other at different seasons. And so we're gonna go into the movie at the point where Julia Roberts is basically standing before him and saying, hey, will you pick me? Will you pick me? Let's watch this clip. Can I just say no to your kind request? Leave it at that. Yes. Fine, of course, I... Of course. Well, I'll just be going. Um, then it was nice to see you. The thing is... With you, I'm in real danger. It seems like a perfect situation apart from that foul temper of yours. <laughs> but my relatively inexperienced heart would I fear not recover uh, if I was once again cast aside as I would absolutely uh, expect to be. Uh, there are just too many pictures of you, too many films. <laughs> you know, you'd go and I'd be uh, well buggered, basically. That really is real now, isn't it? I live in Notting Hill, you live in Beverly Hills. Everyone in the world knows who you are. My mother has trouble remembering my name. Fine. Fine. Good decision. Good decision. The fame thing isn't really real, you know. Don't forget, I'm also just a girl standing in front of a boy asking him to love her. I'm just a girl standing before a boy asking him to love her. I remember watching that film and that line like sent me to the floor. It was like so painful, I couldn't even stand up. Like 
that is, it was so painful. And what I love about this movie is it shows this woman who, if you look at her life, you think she's got it all. She's got it all together. Everything that money could buy, she has it. But the one thing money can't buy is love, right? And when you are hungry for something so intangible, so um, at the core of your being, it doesn't matter if you're the wealthiest woman in the world, that unmet desire, there's no prescription for it. There's no prescription for an ache like that. And the woman we're gonna talk about tonight, her name is Sarah. And Sarah understands that longing that longing that's so unfulfilled, that longing that hurts so deeply that there's nothing in the world that can satisfy that longing except for the Lord God Almighty. And Sarah in the Bible, what's interesting about Sarah is she's mentioned more time in scripture than any other woman. I think because most of us can identify with the ache that Sarah experienced. Sarah's mentioned more times than Mary, the mother of Jesus. She is listed in the Hall of Fame as one of the heroes of faith. Why? Because when we look at Scripture, every time you look in the Bible, uh, there's this principle called first mention. Anytime you see the first mention of something in the Bible, that tells us a lot about either that word or that person. And I want you to hear how Sarah is described in the first mention of her in the Bible. It says this. It's talking about Abraham, uh, her husband. It says, but Sarah, his wife, anytime your, your name starts with a but, you know, that's an asterisk beside you. But Sarah was barren. Now in our age, that's not a word that has a lot of shame, but in Sarah's culture where as a woman, your identity was being a mother, your identity was having a family, you weren't a career woman, you weren't doing other things. Your entire identity was wrapped around your family and being a mom. And Sarah's first mention in scripture was Sarah was barren and she had no child. So when we look at the women of the Bible, here's why I wanna look at Sarah. Is if you've ever lived with a painful, unmet desire, you can relate to this woman. Maybe you are, you've never been married and there's a longing deep in your heart for that. If you've lived with an unmet desire for a long time, then you can relate to the woman we're gonna talk about tonight. If you've ever asked the question, when God? Or the question, why God? Then you can relate to Sarah. If you've ever struggled with envy, over someone else's life. Can we just all confess that Instagram sometimes is from the devil? I'm sorry, I scroll through, I scroll through and I look at people's pictures and meanwhile, my Spanx are wearing Spanx, can we just be honest? My Spanx are wearing Spanx. And I see these people, I'm like, do they eat? I don't understand this. So if you've ever struggled with envy by looking at someone else's life, then you can relate to Sarah. If you've nearly just given up hope because hope is too painful, then you can relate to Sarah. And I believe we need to examine her because if we don't, our secret hopelessness, our silent suffering, our pain that we don't wanna talk about, here's what it begins to do, it begins to eat us alive. If we don't come together as women and say, you know what, this is hard. This is hard and I'm struggling in this. If we don't come together as women and say that, then we open the door, we have an opportunity for the evil one to come in. We have a tempter who wants to come in in our broken places and our hurt places and he wants to do a number on us. So this is the place that we're gonna come together and we're gonna talk about these things. Because Proverbs 13 says this, a hope deferred makes the heart sick. Think about that. If you have a longing that you've been living with or a prayer that you've been praying and the Bible acknowledges this, don't you love that the Bible doesn't just sugarcoat stuff and go, you know what, you just need to get better and be a good church lady and put a smile on it. I was never a good church lady and I was never good at smiling through pain. Anybody else? 
I am raw and real. And I, you know, in my hardest days of hope deferred, making my heart sick, I would be on the front row wailing and embarrassing people because I didn't want it to fester inside of me. And I wanted to bring it to the one who could do something about my problem. Amen? And so the Bible acknowledges that this world is hard. The Bible acknowledges that we are living in a, a world where our bodies are broken, where marriages are broken. The Bible acknowledges that this is not the way it's supposed to be, so how do we walk by faith and not by sight in the midst of this? So I want us to look at Sarah's story. If you're following along your scripture, um, Sarah's story is part of a bigger story. Can everyone say a bigger story? And Sarah's story really is part of God's big narrative of what's happening on earth. Because last month we talked about Eve. If you were here, we talked about how God created us to be in relationship with Him. He made us in wiredness for one with, oneness with Himself, but that oneness was shattered and we were left, we were sent out of fellowship with God, but God had this plan to redeem us and bring us back, to restore us into relationship with Himself. And through Eve's story, we learned that it was going to be a child of a woman that was going to come up and be part of this redemption story. Well, today with Sarah, we get the next piece of the puzzle. As humanity, as we left, Adam and Eve left the garden and sin just infiltrated the world, we see this unraveling of humanity. As you read through Genesis 1 through 10, you begin to see how dark and depraved it came. And then at Genesis 12, this light turns on. And if you like to write in your Bibles, these verses that we're about to read are really the key to unlocking the whole of the Bible. It's that important. Because what we're about to read is where God steps back into the story and He calls forth one man, his name is Abram. His name is going to be turned into Abraham. And God makes a covenant with this man. Say covenant with me. A covenant is not a contract. A contract is where two parties both agree to something and they both have responsibility. A covenant is where God says, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. So what's going to happen here is this amazing moment in Scripture where God calls out one family, one man, his name is Abraham and God makes a covenant with him. Here's why Sarah matters, because she's married to Abraham before this ever happens, okay? And so we pick up in Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So P.S., Sarah, pack up the house, get the pod ready, put everything in there, get the carrot, get all of that, put it in there. We don't know where we're going, but we're following God. Okay. There's a reason the chick goes down in the hall of faith, because she packed up the pod, she got the caravan, and she said, well, God said, we're going, we're going. And she went. In verse 2, God says, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, everyone say, in Abraham. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So this is a loaded, packed promise where God has told Abraham three things are part of this covenant. There's land, there are going to be descendants more than the eye can see, more than can be counted. And through a descendant of Abraham, the whole world will be blessed. Now this is a prophecy about Jesus, the Messiah. Now they don't know that at the time. They're believing God by faith that he has said these words. Now, we fast forward in Sarah's story just a little bit, they obey God, they leave their homeland, and in that culture to leave your family is a breaking and a tethering, a tethering of ties here, okay? This is not normal behavior for them to step out and follow God in this way, to leave their homeland and to go where they do not know where they're going, but they do it by faith. And so we see they travel and we get to Genesis 15. And God reinstates the covenant once again with Abraham and Sarah. In Genesis 15, 1, we see this. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. He says, fear not, Abram. I am your shield. 
your reward shall be great. But Abraham said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. Can you imagine as Sarah standing by hearing Abraham say this to God, how much shame she felt? How much probably undeserved guilt she felt? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, behold, you have given me no offspring and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so your offspring shall be. And notice this, mark this in your Bible. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. That's another key to understanding the entire Bible. God spoke something, and Abraham heard the word of God, and by faith, he could not see it, he could not imagine it, but by faith, he said, what God has spoken, I believe is truth. And right there, right then, Abraham was counted as righteous before God. Not because of works that he did, not because he tried to earn God's favor, it was simply God, you have spoken it and I believe it. And that is what makes us righteous before him. It is an act of faith. Now Sarah is part of this story. The entire covenant promise hinges on her fertility. No pressure. You think she's taking her temperature? (laughs) She thinks he's texting him, come home, I'm ovulating. Do you think she has tried to make this thing work out the way it's supposed to, you know? And year after year, what we know about this ancient culture is, I try to imagine Sarah every month hoping. God said, we're gonna have generations. God said, we're gonna have children, and month after month, hoping and hoping, and then that visitor comes. And in that culture, women would go off to the red tent together, because you know if you get four of us in in a room together, we're all gonna be together. You get that, right? (laughs) If they lock these doors on us, and we were here for two weeks, we would all be together. For those children walking, watching online, I will not explain this, okay? <laughs> so they would march to the red tent together. And one out of one, one after another, Sarah's friends would get pregnant and they wouldn't come to the tent. Another friend would get pregnant and they wouldn't come to the tent. And then finally, Sarah stopped needing to go to the tent. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. So as it seemed like, everyone say seemed like, it seemed like all hope was gone, right? It seemed like it was too late. It seemed like God was not going to bring a child through Sarah. You know what Sarah did? She says, "Hmm, I think God needs my help. (laughs) Anybody ever said that? God. I know you had a plan, but let me present plan B. Let me present an alternate route to what you had. You had a great idea. You know what? You, you spoke solar systems into orbit, and we're real thankful what you did with the blue whales because they are magnificent. And all of this creation, lavender fields, that was a nice touch. But you know what? I don't really under, think you understand how difficult it has been for me to get pregnant. So I'm going to help you out, God. Sarah presents plan B. And plan B went something like this. She looked at her maidservant, who was probably like 17 and fertile. And she already hated her anyway, right? And she thought, you know what? Everybody's doing it. It's totally normal. This is what our world does. If I can't get pregnant, I'll just give him my servant and he can have a baby for me through her. 
And so Sarah does what, let me just, let's not judge her. This was what the world did at that time. This was what they thought was normal. And so Sarah presented plan B to Abraham. Let's read about that, Genesis chapter 16. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Again, really, we get it, right? She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. <clears throat> and Sarah said to Abram, behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarah said to Abraham, may the wrong, I love this, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between me and you. P.S. was it not her idea? <laughs> so plan B was to help God out. And you can understand how she got there, right? Because I don't know about you, if you've ever been through a waiting season, it's painful and it's almost torturous sometimes. And the lies of the enemy that bombard you in that wilderness are so targeted at your faith. They're so targeted at your trust in God. They're so targeted at your hope in the promises of God. And so when you get in that moment, you want any way to escape it and you're looking for an escape route and that's bam, when the temptation strikes. Well, the rest of the world's doing this and that works just fine for them. Well, if you only do this, or I can get what I want this way. I put on your notes just a little historical insight. In ancient times, a man who had no son could adopt a favored servant as his heir, or a man who had no son could take a second wife to produce an heir. Some marriage contracts even spelled out this provision. A wife was obligated to have children. If she could not, she was required to find her husband another wife who could. Now, I say that was customary in ancient times. That was not the biblical principle. This is not God's plan. That's man's plan. God's plan we saw in Genesis was husband, wife, two people become one flesh and they live happily ever after. That was God's plan. Man's plan was we'll, we'll, we'll manage things our way. And that's why Proverbs says this. I love this verse. It's one of my life verses and I come back to it every time I'm trying to figure out how to navigate in a situation. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart, okay? That means everything that we have that we choose to trust Him. We choose to not look with our eyes at what we can see, but trust in God. And then the next part says, lean not on your own understanding. Here's why. Sometimes our minds cannot be trusted, amen? Sometimes we evaluate a situation based on our, our past feelings, based on our hormones, based on the, what the world's telling us is truth, and the Bible specifically says, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge Him, who? Acknowledge the Lord, and then He will direct your paths. See, in this situation, I don't think Sarah was trusting the Lord with all her heart because if she was, she would have believed the promise where God said, I am going to bring a child through you. She was leaning on her own understanding, which says, you know what? I can fix this. You know what? I can fix him. You know what? I can get what I want for myself, how I want to get it. Has anyone ever been tempted that way? I know I sure have. The enemy always wants us to settle for second best. The enemy always wants us to settle for what we can fix for ourselves rather than what God can deliver in his perfect timing. This did not turn out well for Sarah and Abraham. This caused major friction in their marriage. This caused a child to be born named Ishmael that caused major 
major, can I get another thesaurus out there? A lot of turmoil in the world because of Sarah's decision, okay? And as a result, this, this helping God out, which we're all tempted to do at times, set into motion a lot of drama and conflict within their home and within the world. But here's the thing, God is faithful when we're faithless, amen? God is faithful to his promises. God is faithful to his covenant. God is faithful to do what he said he will do. If we turn now to Genesis 17, we see the fulfillment of what God promised them as a family. In Genesis 17, I want to see the first thing is Genesis 17. Here God has restated the covenant again, and he says, uh, verse 9, God said to Abram, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male shall be circumcised, every male throughout your generations. Both he is, verse 15, I'm sorry, go down there, verse 15. And God said to Abraham, as far as Sarah, your wife, she shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come for her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child. And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. Now, in the stories we're about to read, the word laugh is mentioned three different times. And here's what's cool about the Bible. Each time the word laugh is mentioned, it's using a different word from the Hebrew. And when Abraham laughed, it was like, you know that movie um, that they go, inconceivable, like, you know, uh, uh, the the Princess Bride, thank you. When they're talking about inconceivable, Abraham's like, shut up, really? Like, it was like he had just won something. He laughed like, this is too good to be true kind of laughter. In a minute, we're going to see Sarah laugh, and it's quite different, okay? Isaac, however, his name means laughter, and here's where God is so cool. In the Hebrew, it's this word that means when you laugh at your enemy. Isaac was named, basically, I'm laughing at the one who's come against me because you will not win. He is the child of promise, and in him, it's God's already looking forward to Jesus Christ. He's already looking forward to the descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who will come as the Redeemer, and he's laughing over the enemy and go, you watch what I'm doing. His name carried that sense of God rolling up his sleeve and saying, I'm coming for my people. Now, Sarah, Genesis 18, she laughs in a different way. Genesis 18, verse 9. And it says, so the angel of the Lord has come. He's meeting uh, with Abraham. He's about to tell him some things that are going down. And by the way, he drops this bomb. Hey, we're going down to Sodom tomorrow. We'll be back in a little bit. But he drops this bomb about Sarah. He says, then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. So they're outside having some, you know, hummus, and inside is Sarah, you know, and the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Boom, mic drop. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him, and now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. And the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. That's so polite to say that. But the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed. And this laugh is more the laugh of, when when you look at the word, it's more of like being scorned at. It was almost she laughed in disbelief. Like if you were to look someone and be like, are you crazy? That kind of laugh. 
She laughed to herself saying, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And say, shall indeed bear a child now that I'm old? And verse 14 is our verse for the night. It says, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about the next year and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied and said, I did not laugh. I did not laugh. And the Lord said, no, but you did. You did laugh. And so we see this ongoing promise. God repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly comes to Abraham and says, you're gonna have a child, you're gonna have descendants, this is my covenant with you, here's my promise. Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. Sarah, meanwhile, the one in whose womb all of this is depending, is watching in the natural and going, it's too late! It's over! But there was still a kernel of hope in her that wanted to believe. She wanted to believe. And when all was said and done, God worked a miracle because what is verse 14 says, is anything, is anything too hard for the Lord? Now let's read the conclusion of Sarah's story. Genesis 21. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Here's the thing with God. His timetable is different than our timetable. His clock does not run according to human standard time. That's not the way his clock works. God's will and God's ways may baffle us, they may confuse us, but God is never late, he is always on his time. Verse three, and Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore, he called him Isaac. Laughter over the enemy. All those who said, y'all are stupid for believing God, right? Laughing at all the same, why would you follow this God who you can't see? Why would you leave your homeland to follow this God that you do not see with your eyes? All those who scorned at them, this child of promise, the joy of laughter in that home as they watched that baby born, saying, God did it. God did it. Despite what the world said, God did it. And Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. That's a different word right there in the Hebrew. That's the laughter that comes from joy that has been fulfilled. A hope that has fulfilled, that has produced joy that is unspeakable. Now here's the thing. I believe every woman in this room is waiting on something, right? If I were to come down and walk around and we would do a poll, you could tell me, here's what I'm asking God for. Here's what is the most painful thing I am waiting for right now. We could all confess something that we're waiting for. And I believe in our lives, all of us will spend time in a waiting room. So how do we do that? What do we learn from Sarah in the waiting room? I love what Isaiah 40 says. It says, those who wait upon the Lord will get new strength. They will rise up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weak. So how do we wait well? Number one, if you're taking notes, find beauty in your season. Find beauty in your season. Um, October is my birthday month, if you're keeping track. October is my birthday month. Um, years ago, as um, I was doing the Sarah thing and I was clicking years by because one more year, one more year, one more year, my birthdays were painful. They weren't fun. And one year, um, it was right before I actually ended up meeting Justin and um, I did not want to have my birthday because it was too painful. 
And so I booked a flight. I thought, where can, I was going to get on the plane in the morning, and I wanted to land in a different time zone so I could just completely escape the birthday. And so I did. I had a friend that was leaving, living in Seattle, so I flew out of Houston in the morning, and, you know, it's a cross-country flight, and so by the time I landed, you know, October 10th was almost over. It was almost gone. So it was victory for me. And um, as I was having my pity party on row 32C um, with my peanuts and my pity party, I opened my Bible, and um, the Lord's like, you done. You done. You done with your pity party. And I was like, No. I still have some venting I'd like to do here by myself in row 32C, if you don't mind. And um, I was just flipping through the Bibles, one of those Bible roulette things where you just open it up, and I just thought, there's nothing for me in Ecclesiastes, so I'm safe, you know? (laughs) And so I landed in Ecclesiastes, and there's this amazing passage in Ecclesiastes 3 um, that says there's a season for everything. There's a time for mourning and a time for dancing. There's a season for everything. And then there's this line that everything is beautiful in its time. And the Holy Spirit just hit me like a rock. I was judging my season that I was in and I was declaring not good. I was declaring it unbeautiful. And I was putting myself in the place of God to decide what was good for me. And I decided that I didn't like the season I was in because I had all these unmet desires. I wasn't married, I didn't have children, I didn't have this, I didn't have this, I hadn't this. So I had declared a big, this stinks over my season. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit said, you have a choice right now You can find the beauty or you can live bitter. You can find the beauty or you can live in bitterness. And it was this mindset shift that I literally got off that plane and I felt like a command from the Lord to choose to embrace the season that God had me in and find beauty in it, to experience it, to understand that He is sovereign and He is good and that He wanted me. This wasn't a punishment. This wasn't to hurt me. There was a purpose in this season and I needed, there was only one time that I was gonna be able to experience that season and God was calling me not to give into the bitterness and the indulgence of the pity party that the enemy wanted me to stay in, but to open my eyes and go, oh my goodness, I am, I can run hard for Jesus and give him everything in my life right now and I don't have to wake up at two in the morning with a toddler. I can do whatever God's called me to do and I can run hard and do this. And I began to change my mindset. I began to live harder for the glory of God knowing that God was not going oops over my life. He had ordained the season I was in for my good and for his glory. And that changed my mindset to be able to understand that everything can be beautiful in its time. I have a friend in this room right now who I know has battled a severe illness and I've watched her over Facebook give glory to God in the midst of it. And what she doesn't know is that in her season, God is preaching to thousands of people through her suffering. And what she's walking through, it is this testimony, a bullhorn that's declaring that God is good. God is good. What Satan has intended for evil, God is using for good to bless so many people and point to his glory. Now, would she have asked for that season? I don't think so. But it can be beautiful when we put it in God's hands. Second thing the Lord taught me about the waiting room is to pray persistently. Pray persistently. I will stand before you and tell you that everything I have in my life today is because I prayed the heavens down and I did not take no for an answer. Not that God gave me one. I just kept praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. Here's what prayer is. It's us coming before the maker of heaven and earth and going, God, this hurts. God, I need help. God, this is unfulfilled and you made it all. Can you fix it? Amen? And here's the cool thing. Jesus praised 
the persistent widow. When Jesus taught us about prayer, you know what he said? He goes, be like the woman that's just gonna bang heaven's door down until you get what you want. My friend Helen is in the room. Helen, will you stand up and wave at everybody for a second? I, I, she's not gonna stand up, but if you wanna hear a testimony, hi Helen. My friend Helen has taught me about being persistent with God just about more than anybody I know. Because you know what she does? She's been waiting on God to do a lot of stuff for a long time, but she doesn't stop praying. And recently, she, every time I see her, she says, you're never gonna guess what God did. And if you know Helen, you know it's this phrase right here. You're never gonna guess what God did. And I can't wait because I know he's done something big because she's been praying. And what she told me this week, that she'd been praying years for this family member of hers. Years for this person that she thought was so far from God. And then about six weeks ago, she asked our church to start praying. And so this woman's been beating God's door down, beating God's door down. And then that family member calls her and says, Grandma, will you come to church with me? As if he's the one dragging Grandma to church. <laughs> and we can't stop celebrating because this prodigal has come home. And you know why he came home? Because his grandmother has been beating heaven's door down. Amen? Someone give a hand to God over that. Luke 18, 1 through 8, if you want to put that on your notes, Jesus praised the persistent widow. You know why? Because she believed God was good. She believed God was able. She believed God was still in the miracle business. She believed what the Lord told Abraham, is anything too hard for me? You know what we do with our human calculations? We get our, our calculator and we go, well, I am 39 and um, my likelihood of actually conceiving decreases every year. And we start putting our human calculations into it. And when God's like, I'm sorry, the last time I checked, I spoke solar systems into orbit. The last time I checked, you only have breath in your body because I willed it. The last time I checked, all this is mine and it obeys my command. So let's check out who is able to do what and who's not, okay? And so what prayer does is we just say to God, I know you can. I know you can. I was 37 years old and I was sick and tired of being single. I got every single girl in, in Houston. I said, we are going to pray right now. <laughs> We're going to pray. Because they're all addicted to porn or they're all lost or whatever, and we're going to just have to fight some wars over these men out there, okay? The other half like men, and we're going to have to pray, okay? And so we start praying hard, you know, like tears on the carpet hard. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm not letting Satan win. And we start praying harder. And I learned that from my friends who had this infertility group and they're all praying for babies and one after one after one start getting pregnant. I'm like, well, there's something in that prayer, you know? As if the Bible didn't tell us to do it in the first place. It's like we discovered this thing called prayer, you know? And so we started praying. And I'm telling you why, when I walked down that aisle, I was like herky, high kick, G Jesus, you wrong because it wasn't about him, although you're nice. It was about Jesus won, amen? And I'm sick and tired of the enemy winning, so let's start praying. On that point, number three, resist the enemy. Here's what we're resisting. Can I just talk to my single ladies for a second? By all means, please resist the urge to settle for less than God's best for you. Amen. Here's what it's going to look like. You're going to be like, Jesus, I want a godly man who loves you, who's serving you, who's taller than me, all of that stuff, okay? <laughs> the enemy is going to bring Zac Efron up to you. <laughs> Jesus and he is gonna be the, the devil does not wear a pitchfork and a cape he looks like Zac Efron that is all I have to say okay so just realize that um, for the rest of us if you're not waiting on God for that here's the thing resist the enemy to walk in the world's wisdom your marriage might be going through a lot right now and you're gonna have ungodly friends give you ungodly advice. Here's what you need to do. Here is plan 
be. And that is, that's what we've got to resist when we're waiting. We've got to resist um, the taking matters in our own hands. Well, I'm going to show him. Whatever that temptation looks like for you, we've got to resist bitterness and hopelessness. So what does Sarah teach us about God? Let's close with this. Sarah, number one, she teaches us that we have a good father who gives good gifts. We have a good father who gives good gifts. James 1.17, is that up there? I love this verse. Um, I, I'm going to teach you really quickly something. In Scripture, there are two words that mean the word. There's the word logos, which when you open the Bible, that is the logos. That is the written expression of God's will. That's his word. Now, when God takes one of those words and deposits it inside of you, that's called a rhema word. Everyone say rhema word. Okay? That's where that written word has become a word from God for you. Now, this is what James 17 was for me in my waiting season. It says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation and shadow due to change. And here's what that means. In my darkest hours of waiting, God spoke this word to me. And what it means is, I am good. God says, I am good. Not only that, I'm a good father. And every good gift comes from me to you. So, if in this season, marriage was a good gift for you, Marion, you would be married. If that job that you want is a good gift for me, for you, you would have that job. If this were good, because here's the thing, here's what is so hard for us to understand. Only God is good and only God knows what good is, okay? And so here's the word that he wants us to understand. He is good, he is a good father and he loves you, he wants good for you, he delights in you and if right now you're praying for something and that has not happened and you're walking his will and you know there's not an area of rebellion, there's not an area where you're trying to live in the world but live with God, if you're running after God and God has said no or God has said wait, here's what we can know, that that thing right now in this season is not his highest and best doesn't mean there won't be a season that it is. But what we can rest in is we know that his goodness, A, understands more than we can understand. He sees outside of time. He knows what's coming. He knows what good is. And we cannot comprehend what that means. Sarah went decades with an unfulfilled longing. Decades. And it seemed to her at 30, 40, 50, 60, those would have been good years. But God understand there was more going on in the story than Sarah could understand in the natural realm. And that's sometimes where faith comes in. That's all the time where faith comes in. When we can't understand in the natural, we just have to believe he is good. When we can't understand in the natural, we have to believe he is good. That's why 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. The second thing we understand what this Sarah teaches about God is number two, God's delays are not God's denials. God's delays are not God's denials. Here's the thing. I... I so battled the Lord, I did not want to get up here and talk about myself, okay? Because there's so many amazing stories like Helen and other people and my friend Becky that I'm like, I, I, I just sick of talking about myself. But here's the thing, we sang a song earlier and it said, you rescued me so that I could stand to praise you, okay? So just let me just know that I don't want to talk about myself, but I just want to give glory to God. Can I just give glory to God for a second? got married at 38 and 
I thought that was the miracle. I thought that was a miracle. I was like, God, you have done it all. Let's go home, Jesus. This is, um, the miracle has happened, okay? I, I think my mother could have gone home to Jesus at that point because she was tired of praying, okay? And God did more than I could have asked or imagined. I had this amazing husband and these two bonus boys and so everything in me said, be content. You're so blessed, you're so happy. And I was, and I was so happy and I was so thankful and I just would weep over God's goodness all the time. And there was this thing in me and I didn't even wanna say it out loud, I wanted a baby and I was like, how dare I ask God for more? but I wanted a baby and I'm like, how dare I ask God for more? He's already given me all this, I can't even ask. And you know, I was trying to walk with my husband who was like, you know, we have a great family, this is good, the boys need this time, we're, we're good. And I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh, I'm good, we're good, I don't need. But then there would be a movie like, what to expect when you're expecting. <laughs> and I would laugh and it's a comedy. And then I would go from laughing in the comedy to sobbing my eyes out. The moment J-Lo gets the adopted baby, I'm like heaving sobs and snot comes out of my face and, I'm, and, and Justin's like, you okay? I'm fine, I'm so content, we're great, I'm, all, I'm happy. And like in complete denial of how much I wanted a child, okay? And I'm sobbing, sobbing. And then I was like, not even praying about it because God, you've been too good. How dare I ask for anything else? I've been too good and um, I'm 42, so we all know that ship has sailed, you know, like. And then I began to slowly pray about it, like barely sticking my toe in the, in the, in the pool of hope, just slowly praying about it. And not even really telling him, but just like slowly dare I hope. And then we were in Australia and I watched the Lord do something in him. And he looked at me and he said, I think we're supposed to have a baby. And I was like, you think? <laughs> and so we come back and, um, I'll spare the details, but, um, <laughs> um, about six weeks later, I thought I had mono. I thought I had, you know, all kinds of diseases. Me and WebMD are not safe. And three pee sticks later, I'm like, shut up. Like that inconceivable laughter, that inconceivable laughter. And her name is Sydney for a reason, you know? <laughs> And I just, I love that God's delays are not God's denials. And I just wanna to speak to a woman in this room right now if you're like, the, but the pain's still here. Here's, the, here's what I, I just, I just have to, before any of these things I can praise God about, I had Jesus. And here's what God told Abraham before he told him there would be a child, before he told him that on his promise, he said, I, the Lord said, I am your reward. The child was not the reward. The husband's not the reward. The baby's not the reward. Jesus is the reward. Jesus is the reward. And in this journey, we will all walk through things that we're living with the unmet the not yet. That is part of our journey until we see him face to face. Because the ultimate longing, the ultimate thing that we're hoping for and waiting for will not all be answered in this world. It is when we are back with him face to face for eternity. And so I wanna be really sensitive to that, but here's the last point on your blanks. Faith pleases God. Faith pleases God. My mom's probably watching this and she reminds me so much of my friend Helen, but um, this world is hard, right? I mean, sickness and marriages under attack 
and unmet desires, but here's the thing, in the midst of it, we are not people of denial. We are people who look at our God who is bigger and stronger, and we believe that what he has promised, he will do, and we do not look at what our eyes can see. And this is what my mom teaches me all the time. We look at the one who has promised. And when we do that, here's what scripture says to us, that pleases God. And when we live with him for eternity, there are gonna be record books where we stood our ground in the midst of a war zone and go, but I know my redeemer lives, you know? I know my redeemer lives. And that's where we plant our feet in the faith. Here's the, hear this scripture. In Romans, when Paul is talking about what faith looks like in the gospel, what it looks like us to believe God, it's talking about Abraham and Sarah as an illustration that says, against all hope, Abraham and hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet, everyone say yet. He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded, everyone say that, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised to do. Can you imagine wrinkled, gray-haired Sarah hearing that promise of God, I'm going to come back next year and you're going to have a child when she got over laughing, this seed of hope filled her again. And can you imagine as her womb began to grow and the life began to fill her, that she said, you did it, you did it. Here's the cool thing about Sarah's story. Sarah's story is a part of a much bigger story. When you open the Gospels where Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus our Redeemer, Jesus the one who came to make all things new, Jesus the one who came to rescue us from our sin, Jesus who came to deliver us from this dark world. We don't get to Jesus if we don't have Sarah. And I wanna tell someone going through a hard time right now, your story is not over. And you do not understand what God is working for your good and his glory. Because through Sarah came Isaac, where God laughed over his enemy. And through Isaac came Jacob. And through that genealogy came King David. And through King David came the promise of the deliverer, the king of kings, the king of glory. And that king was born. The king of heaven came to earth. Why? So that he could rescue us. That's the gospel. Sarah's story, Sarah's suffering, Sarah's waiting was for a purpose. So that the king of glory could come into this world.